Well, thank you, Kevin. So again, welcome everyone. And, um, uh, and in just a few minutes, Dr. Johnson will talk about his work. And I'd like to tell you how I first met him was at a conference of the Peace and Justice Studies Association, which is the, um, the only professional organization for educators and students uh, in the field of peace and justice studies. And I sat down at a table looking for a good place to sit. And there was Dr. Johnson. And he told me about a wonderful book on careers in um, peace and justice studies. And then also when I was tr trying to work with faculty here to build a peace and justice studies program, I turned to him for advice and he uh, gave Dr. Emily Davis and me a tour of the facilities at Westchester University connected with peace and justice, and then also reviewed our proposal. So we're deeply indebted to Dr. Johnson for his support for the peace and justice studies program here. Um, so we, we, as you know, we traditionally start our Friday seminars by asking for announcements. Does anyone have any special announcements of papers, presentations, family events, vacations? We have a big GIS UD Delaware event on Wednesday. So you guys, if you have any time between like 9.30 and 1.30, come join us. You'll be fed, there'll be food, which is always just a kind of a real plus. Um, so come join us over in the um, Center of Arts. Great, thank you. Any other announcements too of upcoming events or past conferences attended uh, recently? Okay, our next tradition is to ask if there are any diversity shares, anything that you did or experienced that promoted diversity, equity, or inclusion. Yes. So I got permission to advertise today for a new award called the Breaking Barriers Award, where we're recruiting uh, uh, students into our PhD program who are from underrepresented groups in the United States. So if those of you who are on Twitter want to retweet that out or to send it off to any of your uh, master's candidate friends, please do. Great. Thank you, Lindsay. Wonderful. So um, without further ado, I turn this over to Dr. Dean Johnson. You all hear me okay? Great. Just give me a moment here. Uh, so my name is Dean Johnson. I'm director of the Peace and Conflict Studies program at Westchester University. I'm also a professor of philosophy. In the philosophy department, I also teach religious and theological studies courses, and I'm affiliated faculty with the Women's and Gender Studies program. So a few hats uh, that I wear. Um, <clears throat> just a, a little about me, I grew up in the Midwest. So being on the kind of East Coast is new in the last 10 years. And um, it has allowed me to think about communities in several different ways. Um, uh, my undergrad is, was at a small private liberal arts institution where I studied sociology and peace studies. I then went on to do a master's in theology with an emphasis in peace studies. And then ended up eventually doing a PhD uh, at the joint program with the University of Denver and the Isle of School of Theology in Colorado in uh, religious and theological studies, but with a focus in religion and social change. Part of the reason for that was because at that time, the only PhDs in peace studies were in Europe, and I didn't feel like relocating my whole family there. So many of the people that do peace and justice studies work are doing that under the guise of multiple disciplines. Right? So having a conversation like this with a program in a department like this is not unusual because as I looked over what you have been doing and what you talk about, at least on the website and the publications that have come out and the kinds of presentations that have happened, it's clear to me that you are already doing peace and justice work long before there was a designation of a peace and justice studies kinds of program. And so, um, so I want to open up the space in, in that, that kind of way to think about, well, what does it mean to do peace and justice studies work? Lots of places talk about it in terms of peace studies, conflict studies, justice studies. Right? So those are our three different approaches to the topics. 
Conflict studies really deals with interpersonal, intergroup, and community-oriented conflicts. So how do communities do that? How do individuals do that? How do you do that better? And one of the understandings around conflict is within the field of peace and justice studies and conflict studies as well, is that you have to have conflict in order for change to take place. Because if you don't have conflict, things just kind of keep moving along as they were until someone says, whoa, this isn't working for me. Right? And we see that in, in our interpersonal relationships and we see communities doing that as well. Uh, in peace studies, Traditionally, that has either come out of philosophical traditions, so looking at religion and philosophy and ethics uh, kinds of questions. It also comes out of international studies and political science. So, so those are some of the roots overall. Uh, I'm the membership chair of the Peace and Justice Studies Association, which has existed as it is now for almost 20 years. Um, but it was the coming together of two different organizations prior to that. One was called the Peace Studies Association, and the other one was called COPRED, which was an organization that looked at peace education. And um, they decided at some point in uh, 2001, 2002, 2003, that there was so much overlap between their conferences and constituents that maybe we should come together uh, to do things. And so I was on the board that helped form PJSA when it came into being. Um, uh, and I just returned to the board about six years ago. So I'm, I'm getting, or excuse me, five years ago. I'm getting ready to start my third term as membership chair. So it's an organization that it um, consists of about, right now, 15 different institutions who've declared their membership. Um, and then right around uh, 315 individual members. Uh, and these are people from all over the, the country. Uh, we're connected to the International Peace Research Association, which is an international group. And so we're the North American um, branch of that. But when we look at what's uh, who belongs to PJSA, it tends to be people who are um, organizers, who are activists, who are scholars, either at the college level uh, and university level or at the primary education level. So we, we, we do have some teachers in high schools and other places who are involved. So most of the people that I associate with, they maybe describe themselves as interdisciplinary. So they, they pull from a variety of different places in terms of how they understand what's going on in their own work. Uh, some of them talk about themselves as activists and organizers. Some of them talk about themselves as academics. And some of us talk about ourselves in all three ways. So I talk about myself as an interdisciplinary peace studies activist scholar. Right? Um, and so again, it's a lot of hats, but um, what I wanna talk about this, this afternoon is really um, thinking about, um, you know, I, I guess my question is, so what does an interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary activist scholar have to say to a group of people? who make up a uh, geography and spatial planning department, right? What does a guy who uh, does religious and theological studies and these other things have to, to say to a group who's looking at all of the variety of things that you're looking at um, in your department? So I'm gonna talk about that a bit today, what I think might be helpful and useful. So as I talk through things, I'm gonna show a PowerPoint just for the sake of simplicity to say, here's the topic that I'm talking about. And here are some questions that I think you should be thinking about. Um, there's not gonna be an exam, right? Uh, at least not from me. Um, but those questions I'll leave up as we get closer to the end of what I'm talking about. And then we can explore any of those or none of those, whatever you want to explore uh, beyond that. Before I get too much more into this, I do wanna thank um, you for the opportunity of being here. I, I appreciate uh, the work I always like engaging different programs who are doing peace and justice work. Uh, I always learn something in those conversations. And, and so I'm really appreciative of that. And I wanna say a special thank you to Nancy Boyer for her invitation and her hospitality. Um, it's been great to get to know Nancy over uh, the past several years um, and think about this work together and what that looks like in an educational process. And I also want to thank April, who I don't know that I've met today, um, but 
uh, who helped do a lot of logistics work. And so I appreciate uh, the work that she has put in um, to me being here as well. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. Everyone see that okay? All right, so I titled my talk today, Finding Our Way, the Practice of Peace and Justice. Cool. So what I wanna start out with saying is, um, I generally, when I, I first meet students uh, in my own classes, I ask the, um, to, them to think about something that was um, brought to my attention by Elise Bolden. Lisa Bolding is a peace studies educator. Uh, I came across this in several other people's writings as well, um, but she wrote a book called Building a Global Civic Culture, uh, Education for an Independent World. And in that book, one of the things that she talks about is something called the 200 year present. Right? And the idea of the 200 year present is based on the understanding that what came 100 years before your birth directly impacts how you're able to live now. And then what happens after you're born, you impact for the next 100 years. And Bolding talks about this in terms of, uh, if, you, if you want a different image for thinking about it, this idea of uh, imagine yourself as an infant and the oldest person who would have held you as a baby. And then think about what their life was like prior to coming into contact with you. So uh, I can say for my children that uh, the oldest person that would have held them uh, was uh, in their 90s. Right? And so to think about the 90 years that just impacted their lives in a very direct way in that space. Uh, I could talk about it in terms of my own life. So I'm going to disclose my age here. But 100 years before I was born, was 1873. What was going on in the United States during that time? Yeah, we're just coming to the end of the Civil War. We're getting into Reconstruction. So it's possible that if someone 100 years old would have been holding me, I would have had physical direct contact with that past. But part of the reason I bring this up is because we, we talk about things like Reconstruction and the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement and all these other kinds of movements as though they're a long time ago, right? That the, why are we still talking about these things, right? That was, we're talking about people's lives, right? And the generational impact. And so I can tell you that I've been highly impacted by a group of um, civil rights elders uh, in the way I think and the way I teach and the way I talk about the world. And, and for many of them, um, you know, some of them are now um, past, but some of them are in their 70s and 80s and early 90s. If that happened in their lives. Uh, it wasn't that long ago. So when people say things like, why haven't we gotten over slavery? It's only a couple of generations away. Um, and literally, I believe in the newspaper in the last week, I saw, or excuse me, not the newspaper, in an app. I don't actually read a newspaper. Uh, I saw in a news app that um, the oldest person still living um, just died who had parents who were enslaved. Right. And, and so it's really not that long ago. Right. So one, one of the questions that I have for us to think about is what have you inherited? Another question would be, what will be inherited from you? So it doesn't matter what your work is. Right? Well, we, we want to kind of move past this understanding that our life is equated to the work that we do, the job that we have. So some people really do work that they love. Um, they enjoy that. They have a calling into that space. But other people just have jobs to live. Right? And that doesn't necessarily define who they are or what they're able to accomplish. So um, I want us to also think about what does your vision of the future entail? 
So as you're doing the work that you're doing, you know, some of your grad students, some of your faculty members, you know, what does the future look like that you're trying to lead to? And, and how do we start working toward that in some ways now? See if it's gonna let me forward my show here. So that's the 200 year present, this, this understanding of you're impacted by the 100 years that come before your birth, you impact the next 100 years. The next thing that I wanna talk about is beloved community. So beloved community uh, from a recent chapter that I wrote in the Wiley Blackwell Companion on Religion and Peace. Uh, I, I take a couple of quotes from Martin Luther King Jr and from Vincent Harding, who was one of my mentors. Vincent Harding says, beloved community is a place in which all people could discover a sense of our fundamental connectedness as human beings. It is a place where we cannot live in isolation from one another, but we must build a society that not only protects each person's civil rights, but also enables people to relate to one another with love and compassion. This really informs a lot of how I think about the world and what I do as a, a professor and when I'm engaging with students. Um, when we think about the idea of beloved community as it's expressed in social change, it means a vision of people at the grassroots and community level participating in creating new values, truths, relationships, and infrastructures as the foundation for a new society. So the idea of how are we talking with community members? Who's sitting at the table with us? Who's missing from the table? We can also think about beloved community in a, a different kind of way, a more interpersonal way. So we can think about it in terms of the larger space of what do we want those, that community to look like? But when we look at it on interpersonal terms, we all have beloved communities. In ter on interpersonal terms, we can think of um, Beloved community as those people you depend on. Those people who you call when you're having a moment of crisis or a moment of celebration. Right? Who are those people that you, you talk to? And those are probably the same people who are going to call you out on your stuff if you step out of line. Right? This doesn't sound like you. This doesn't seem like the way that you would normally act. Right? So they're going to hold you to some level of accountability. So not just the people who make you feel good. But the people who are like, oh, come on, you got to pull it together. Um, this is not how we act with one another. And so I'd like you to think about who are those people? So who is your beloved community? And how are you building the larger beloved community? Keeping in mind what that vision is for what we want the future to look like. In order for us to further build the beloved community, we must start anew. Maybe we need to rethink things. Maybe we need to rethink them a lot. This is not easy work. It's actually really hard. According to Elder Grace Lee Boggs, quote, the social activists among us struggle to create actions that go beyond protest and negativity and build community because community is the most important thing that has been destroyed in the dominant culture, end quote. When we think about what's going on around us, we don't always see what builds up community. We mostly see communities being torn down. We see uh, ways of identifying people in order to make an us versus them uh, in the world. And so how are we building communities that are inclusive, uh, that start to meet everyone's needs? We're living in some of the most polarizing times in US history, right? we see it everywhere. And as we look around communities, there are very few places for people to freely gather. Start to look around neighborhoods. Where do people come together and talk? We, we see lots of empty and vacant lots when you go into urban spaces, even small towns now where there used to maybe be a community center. There used to be a place where the union gathered. 
Maybe it was a club of some sort. But really right now, there are very few places where people can just be and freely gather and not be accused of loitering. Like this idea of you're taking up the space, so you need to either be arrested or move on. And, and we, can we can talk about how those spaces have, have been created. So if those don't exist, how do we start to create them? Where are those communal spaces? So one of the spaces that is still available to us to think about where the community gathers is the library, the public library. You don't have to pay anything to go in. You can hang out in there for as long as you want most of the time. But even now, we're starting to see um, rampant security in libraries, uh, metal detectors going in, people being asked to leave if they're not going to do anything um, in public spaces. And it's really one of the only public spaces left for especially youth and young adults together uh, without having to pay something. So starting anew is, a, is a, another way of saying it's really time for a revolution. And what do I mean by revolution? I'm not talking about let's go tear down the government. Right? I'm not talking about you know, every institution is bad and therefore we have to do something about it. But I am saying something similar to what you hear from uh, Dr. Vincent Harding and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And so in the Beyond Vietnam speech or sermon uh, that took place on April 4th, 1967, a year to the date before Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, he said, we need to think about creating a revolution of values. And what we currently depend on isn't working. This is 1967, so we're, we're well over 50 years ago. And his concern were things like um, militarism, materialism, racism. Right? We need to rethink how we understand society functions in light of those kinds of things. And so moving away, uh, and, and what this meant was, according to both um, King and, and Harding, was basically moving away from a thing-oriented society, a society where everyone is seen as something that produces or something that buys. Right? So thinking about human beings, uh, lots of times when, when people are talked about, it's about their buying power or their production power. Right? How do we move away from just seeing people as those things right? and, and appreciating them for who they are? So moving away from a thing-oriented society where people are treated like things and are valued for how much they can produce or buy um, toward something that, that takes um, into consideration the worth of people for the sake of just their humanity. This also means we must work to uh, create or work on creating relationships and communities that are transformational rather than transactional. And what I mean by that is if everyone is just treated as something that can give you what you need. That's a transactional sort of thing. It's a transaction. I only relate to you as much as I feel like I can gain something from you. What we want to work toward is something more transformational. Right? Where um, uh, this is creating relationships in communities. Um, by thinking about how we're in solidarity with people, how we're um, co-conspirators or accomplices in what's going on for them. Right? So we're not just engaging with them because it makes us look better. We're engaging with them because we actually care about what's going on and we're gonna allow them to take the leadership role. Right? This, so this is a part of a, a revolutionary way of thinking. And again, it's uh, in this space, you know, over 50 years old. Again, Grace Lee Boggs talks about revolution in terms of evolution. We need to evolve, right? She says, quote, revolution means reinventing culture. With an end of empire, we are coming to an end of the 
epoch of rights. We have entered the epoch of responsibilities, which requires a new, more socially minded human beings and new, more participatory and place-based concepts of citizenship and democracy. For a long time, we've talked about what our rights are. What are your human rights? Who are you, what are your civil rights? And that's okay, but what we haven't talked about are our responsibilities to one another. What is your responsibility to your neighbor, to your community? Um, how do we relate to other human beings, right? So it's just not about my rights, it's about how everyone's being uplifted. Right? And sometimes when we start talking about individual rights, we lose that kind of communal feel. So how do we start a revolution? Uh, Boggs tells us we must have the courage to walk the talk, but we must also engage in the continuing dialogues that enable us to break free of old categories and create new ideas that are necessary to address our realities, because revolutions are made not to prove the correctness of ideas, but to begin anew. In this scenario, everyone has a contribution to make, each according to their abilities, to our energies, to our experiences, our skills, and, we are, and where we are now in our lives, end quote. In terms of research, a good example of this would be Judith Plaskow's article, Embodiment, Elimination, and the Role of Toilets in Struggles for Social Justice. Anyone read this article or know this? So Plaskow is a feminist scholar and this piece looks at uh, or investigates equity based on who has access to public toilets throughout the last couple of centuries. Right? Who has access to public toilets is a social justice issue. And we can go down a list of what that looks like. Right? We're looking early on in the settlement of the, or the colonization of the United States. You know, mostly men are out in public, so there's no need for public restrooms in quite the same way. Uh, and then eventually there are, are restrooms where women are also able to engage those. And then you move along a little bit and we start to think about what happens during Jim Crow segregation. Who has access to this bathroom versus this bathroom? Is there another bathroom? who has access to those toilets. And you take it a step further and we start to think about accessibility based on whether or not you use maybe a wheelchair or a walker. And the most kind of current conversations around that are around gender identity. And do people who have, who identify as transgender or non-binary have a place to use the bathroom in public? All right, so that's a new way of thinking about social justice. I, until I came across this article, I would have never thought, oh, toilets are a justice issue. Right. We can also think about it, I mean, think about how houseless people are treated in cities and whether they have access to public bathrooms. When you go into a place and you have to buy something in order to be able to use the bathroom, you know, part of that is who you're keeping out of the bathroom. Right? When parks are locked at night, um, in order to protect the spaces so they're not vandalized. That also means that people who are houseless don't have a place to go to the bathroom in parks. Right? So this is really is a justice issue. And so when we're thinking about beginning anew, when Boggs is pressing this, when we're thinking about a revolution of values, this is what I'm talking about. Right? How do we start to rethink things? Um, so... What I want to ask you in relationship to this is, in what ways are you revolutionary? How are you thinking about things anew? How are you asking questions about what is established? What's traditional? What's normal? Who decided that? Uh, how are your relationships transformational rather than transactional? And what does beginning anew look like for the work you do or hope to do? Because what I've read and the conversations that I've had, lots of you are concerned about things like climate and communities and the impact of climate on communities. How are you relating to those communities? 
who are you talking to? And I've heard a lot of good work talked about. So again, that's not a question of critique by any means. It's those are the kinds of questions we really should be asking. And so the last thing that I want to talk about, because it was written in the little description uh, that, that Nancy put out, was about nonviolence. Like, how does that all play a role in this? So um, nonviolence informs my vision of the future, of the beloved community, and my understanding of revolution. Can't talk about any of the things that I just mentioned without thinking about those in nonviolent ways. So as I've written elsewhere, I think about nonviolence as a set of beliefs and practices. It's something imagined and yet something that is lived. Right? I think nonviolence is a revolutionary and countercultural way of living and thinking. I believe nonviolence is revolutionary because it uses power, the power of the collective to bring about change. I believe nonviolence is countercultural because it does not use violence to create change. It is also countercultural because nonviolence seeks to break down the system, structures, and institutions that create inequality and violence. Nonviolence is also communal and relational. It is a way we engage with other people. So some of you may not even think about, am I violent or nonviolent or what my tendencies are for that? That's, that's really something you have to, to kind of think about sometimes a lot. Most of us uh, don't like violence, right? And I would say, I don't know anyone who likes violence. So most people are opposed to violence, but are they really nonviolent? Because you can still reinforce violent cultures and, and um, structures and not realize that you're, you're doing violence. And some people live underneath a lot of violence. About um, just what's going on socially, politically, culturally in that polarization process. Right? Your mere embodiment could be love, living in violence all the time. Just who you are as a person could be seen as a threat to some parts of the society. So I, I, again, I would ask the question, um, how are you working to break down the system structures and institutions that create inequality and violence? And how does that inform your work or how you think about your future work? So I'm gonna pause there and ask, what kind of questions do you have? Are there things you wanna to respond to? What would you like to talk about? All right, so we'll do it this way. Okay, go ahead. I was just gonna say, as a geographer, I wanna ask you about scale. Right, sure. So what scale is this work done and how far do our communities extend and where do we start? Those are all really good questions. So my, my question, I would say part of it is scale is really, um, you have to start out small. So lots of organizing work that takes place starts really with just two or three people having a conversation, say in a coffee shop or in a living room and saying, this thing is really messed up. Uh, and, and is there a way that we can, do you think this is a problem too? And then you scale it up from there. Oh, I've talked to so-and-so who also thinks this. And so before you know it, then you have a small collective of maybe 10, 12, 15 people who are also gonna have connections to some more people. And then you start to think about, okay, well, where can we raise these issues? Um, so there's a, a really nice way to start thinking about that. Um, and I talked about it a little bit earlier with the, the group I met with earlier. Uh, there was, uh, there's a piece written by Bill Moyer and Mary Lou Finley called the Movement Action Plan. This really walks through those steps of your step one and, and or stages, I should say. It's really not, um, there are eight stages, and, but you can always get pushed backward at any point. So you can't think of if we've, we've lost progress, then these don't work for us anymore. It's, it is really that. Um, but when I start to think about beloved community, I initially think about, okay, who am I connected to? Who do I feel like are safe people when I'm having stuff going on? How do people recognize me as a safe person to talk to? Because my embodiment also is threatening. Right? Um, 
I hit a lot of the dynamics around having lots of power and privilege culturally and politically. And so um, when I'm not on campus and people don't know that I'm safe, I look just like everyone else who could potentially be a threat. So how do people know that? What am I identifying? How am I identifying myself? Um, but I, I think then working from that in, in just local communities is really the way to start. And if you think you're gonna go big quickly, that's what causes burnout. All right, so you have to start in really small localized spaces and that may take some time. So I mentioned Grace Lee Boggs here a couple of times. I quote her a couple of times. She was an activist to live to be the age of community organizer who lived to be 100. She lived in the same location for about 70 years of her life. And that was Detroit, Michigan. And in Detroit, Michigan today, I mean, she died in 2015. If you ask community organizers in Detroit today where they started to talk about these things, many of them will say in Grace Lee Boggs' living room. Right? She said persistence of being in a place and located in a community for a long period of time allows you to affect social change in some pretty dramatic ways. And that includes for her, for example, of helping create community gardens in food deserts um, and, and growing programs summer after summer around those sorts of things. It includes thinking about how kids are going to get to school who don't have transportation. Um, and so she has, uh, there's a documentary about her um, and, and there's also a book and both have the, the words American revolutionary in them. Uh, but this is where some of these these ideas for sure come from. But um, I, don't, I don't know if that's helpful or not. But uh, yeah, I would say start small and and think, OK, what can I have direct impact on and how do we grow that? Um, other kinds of questions? Yes. So thank you uh, for the discussion. Uh, I, I'm not sure I'm asking it correctly, but what I'm thinking for in was saying how I am contributing, uh, like uh, how I'm seeing my future or in KLVAP, but it is also subjective, right? When you are talking about some kind of changing in the society, so there are um, a structure that existed in the society. So when I am thinking differently what exists already there, so there are also like some kind of conflict and confusion and for uh, from uh, thinking about very subjective way, is that right? Like uh, what I'm thinking and what I'm doing uh, in the picture of the existing social structure. So I don't know, I, I, I am, I'm having the uh, confusion and the conflicts in my mind, but um, sometimes it goes like, uh, um, against of the existing culture, socio-cultural system, and and in this uh, particular socio-cultural system, when you reflect yourself, uh, there might be some kind of confusion and in dilemma. Am I going to the right path or not? Mm -hmm. so I, I'm, I'm I'm not sure. Am I conveying the message you rightly? Yeah. So, so yeah. So, so part of it is. Um, being accountable to other people. Right? So this is part of that beloved community model that says uh, we don't we don't move forward in in our own understanding without actually being in conversation with others to see if that that works, right? Or that that, that makes some sense. Um, now we're also living in a really kind of a different time where people can just seek out people who are going to agree with them and not hold them accountable, right? Everyone can find someone on the internet that they agree with maybe a whole group of people that they agree with, does that mean that those people are acting in just ways? Not necessarily, right? So you just kind of self-reinforce in that way. Uh, what I would say is um, that when you're thinking about your relationship to existing institutions, is that, um, is it a helpful institution? Is it something that you feel a lot of antagonism from? Um, why is that? Like what's, what's going on there in that relationship for you? But I also think that, again, we can't do this on our own. We have to have groups of people that we're processing through these things with. And so if you can find a group of people who are saying, I'd like to see people treated better as human beings in the world, what, what, what can we do to make that happen? 
and then you start doing something that seems completely counter to that, hopefully you can depend on them to pull you back in a little bit and say that that doesn't work, or maybe we should rethink that a bit or, or something like that. And um, I think the problem with existing institutions is they're, they're set up to be self-perpetual, right? So, so, so part of, of thinking about something in a brand new revolutionary way is to say, we really need to discard this old institution and old institutions tend to die hard. And so that, that, that is hard work. And I think also it doesn't mean that everything about every institution is bad. Uh, so are there things that we wanna keep, things that work, things that don't work? I mean, Boggs, for example, would say the way the education system is currently set up doesn't work, isn't gonna work for the future. Um, this understanding of, of doing education where you train a group of experts to do a very uh, specific kind of work actually runs counter to being all inclusive. And so once you find an answer to something, she was very Hegelian in her under, uh, so Hegel is the philosopher she looked to. Hegel was dialogical, and I don't wanna use a bunch of big philosophical words, but this understanding of once you have an answer to a problem, you have new problems that you have to find the answers for. So like, how are you turning all of those things over um, at the same time? So oh, the solution to this was this. And I, when I hear people talking about uh, some of the work that you all have done around climate, like, oh, we thought we could do this thing in this community to save part of this community, but we realized by doing this, it created this problem over here, all right? So we can't stop evaluating and you can't always, you have, to, you have to have some humility in thinking, I'm not gonna be right in everything and I need some people to help me with that. Does that help at all? Yeah. 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 I, I, uh, I've been really struggling with a lot of these ideas in the classroom. Uh, I teach government and environmental policy. Sure. Um, and so we talk about climate change a lot. We talk about structural racism. We talk about all this stuff. And what I find is that, you know, around half the students are kind of jazzed about it. They're like, yeah, we know how this works. We're going to go burn it down. Right. A lot of students, like I, and I just, I'm kind of reaching, like I'm just not sure where to go next because a lot of the strategies that I've always used, like, you know, tell them to start small and mm -hmm. find community and build community. They're, they're so um, distraught already and how to kind of pull them away from just like realizing, yeah, you're not going to fix climate change, but you can help make it better. Right. You know, not being so overwhelmed with how bad some of our systems work that you don't even try anymore. Yeah, and that's a hard place. Uh, and I think that it does, but again, that self-perpetuation promotes that kind of apathy, right? That the sense of, I this is too big to overcome. Uh, so what do we do? Um, there's a part of, of thinking through this um, probably in the last three or four years, um, I would say, uh, where I've talked with people where they're kind of like, um, we don't have time to onboard you completely to get on board. I mean, we don't have time for everybody to get on board with us, but we also don't have time to wait, All right? So we want to pull people in as much as we can, but we're also not going to wait for people to kind of come along. Um, and that's also a hard place to be because um, maybe that group of people doesn't look like you thought they were going to look um, maybe uh, or that they uh, they don't have the same attributes that they thought you thought they were going to have. And my my study of kind of things like the black led freedom struggle say, OK, I've heard elders in the student nonviolent coordinating committee say we showed up to do voter registration in this place. We're all going to live in this house together. Not everybody had the same set of skills. Not everybody uh, knew how to do things like laundry. So what do we do? Somebody took care of the laundry um, or we taught one another how to do those things or nobody knew how to, to, to type before. And so somebody said, okay, I'll figure out how to do that. And, and so there was kind of this coming together sort of thing in terms of not waiting for the person who show up to show up who had that skill set that you were looking for. Um, but I also get that sense of um, great despair. There's a heaviness for sure right now. Um, and I think there's been a heaviness for a long time, but it feels more so um, since 2016, honestly. 
that there's been a lot of things that that le were left not said out loud that have become okay to say out loud. It has led lots of people to feel, and, and the COVID didn't help that um, in terms of people feeling like not connected to other human beings. So how do we reconnect to human beings it has become a, just a basic sort of thing in the classrooms that I'm experiencing anyway. How do we even engage with one another? How do we just know that we're having disagreements, but that doesn't mean I devalue you as a person or you know those those sorts of conversations. But I also like you want to put some energy into that group that's ready to go. Um, and sometimes I think it's okay not to feel like you need to pull everybody along in that. Um, and I think that's a hard place to be like, too. I tell them how the systems work and they're ready to go. Right. And then I tell them how the systems work. And then they're like, oh no, this is gonna Right, sure, sure. No, I, I totally hear that. Uh, I totally hear that. But there that's been that's the struggle, uh, honestly. Um in a lot of places. The system is is not working. Um, or it's working perfectly, right? Depending on how you, which which direction you want to look at that. The system's not working for a group of people. It's clearly working for another group of people or still wouldn't be in place. Um, how do you start to reverse some of that? What does that start to look like? And it does feel impossible, but I think, well, how can I have an impact on that locally? How do I subvert that system in my own life? Um, how do I avoid that? Uh, you can think about it in terms of people who are saying, I won't shop at this particular place or the location. And then you realize the only way you can get the thing you need is to actually buy it from that one place, right? That you didn't want to go to. So do you do without it? Or do you think, okay, I'm minimizing the impact that I'm having here in a negative way. Um, and so you can work through all kinds of justifications yourself in terms of what that looks like. But that system clearly is broken. And so we're all trying to deal with, I, I think, I don't want to speak for everyone. I'll say I'm trying to deal with lots of systems where I look at it and say, this is not right. And so how, how do we start to correct that? And it does mean sometimes using the voting system. Sometimes it means being in the streets. Um, sometimes it means like, you know, literally shutting it down, um, making it not functional anymore to a crisis point where it has to be reconsidered. Like that's what the sit-ins were about. Um, during any sit-in process. That's what boycotts are about, right? This is not working for everyone. We're going to shut it down until we can figure out a new way to do it or say we at least need to reconsider. Um, but systems have been around for a long time. So my only hope in some of that, or, or many times I say, okay, we know a lot of this was created by human beings. So that means it can be torn down by human beings and recreated as some other thing. Climate, you know, it's not, you know, but yes. Kinds of thoughts or questions? I have one, sir. Yes. So thank you for thank your presentation so far. Um, you brought up some very interesting points, you know, um, science in general, especially Western science has a history that's been exclusive to a lot of communities. And I think everyone here is working towards addressing that and trying to build a broader, you know, more inclusive scientific community to get a fuller picture of phenomenon that we're examining, not just from a traditional, often problematic um, standard from the past and try to create a, 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 a new standard. Um, my question is that history is not you know, unnoticed by people outside of the scientific community. So how, uh, how do you, um, how have you gone about, how, how have you seen scientists approach communities that in the past have been excluded mm -hmm. from the discussion, not at the table? How do you bring them in with the same dignity and respect that you would hope that you receive, you know, um, and I mean, and how do you let them know that you are not trying to just refit their lives to match your new or your, your vision of what a scientific phenomenon is? Yeah, so you're breaking yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm kind of dropping the ball here, but you know. Yeah. So, so let me see if I can clarify what what you're saying, or see if I have the question before I try to answer it. Um, 
So communities who've, who've been left out generally, how do you approach those communities and how do you create a vision with those communities? Um, and, and maybe that's based on uh, the sense of that there's a low, high level of distrust. Um, it like, I, I think, does that get at some of what you're asking? Yeah, I guess to just to clarify a little bit further, so, um, how, how I'm sorry, so how do you how do we create a new side of a community with mutual respect? You know, what can we do as scientists yeah. that sort of creates mutual respect on both sides of this new conversation that we're trying to have? Yeah, I, I think that's hard because, um, and and it is a a, a good question. Um, I think you have to leave space to not be in charge, right? So you you can say, here's the idea that I have, here's what I've been thinking about, but then you have to be like, okay, I, I have to have enough kind of humility to say, I know I don't have all the answers. And so the reason we're bringing this group together is to try to gather that in a way that it's not been done before. I will tell you as someone who is identified as white going into spaces that um, are, uh, um, black and brown, um, primarily, uh, you just have to, I have to say, I have to earn that trust, right? So I have to work through a space where I'm building the relationships in a trustworthy way that I'm, what, what Bog says here, walking the talk and not just um, using a lot of lip service because there's been a lot of this transactional kind of thing that goes on in those spaces. And it means that I may not be the one who's in leadership Right, so that that I'm I'm kind of helping set the stage, but I take a step back. But I also want to make sure it keeps pushing forward. So I may have to be the one to say, I feel like we're stalling here. Maybe we there's another way of going. So it really de depends on the scenario. I can tell you at my um, places where I work, the big thing that we're going through right now is what it means to uh, decolonize the philosophy department. Right? Because when we talk about philosophy on most campuses or religious studies, the primary group that has framed those conversations has been Eurocentric men. Right? So what does it mean to say we're going to study philosophy? And why is it different to say we're going to study African American philosophy or Asian philosophy? Why are those not philosophy? Right. So we've set up these systems. So part of it is trying to figure out how do we deconstruct that, but we need other people at the table to say this, this, is, this um, is a better way forward. But that also is then asking some people who've been left out of the conversations to do some work for people who've really messed things up, right? So there, there's a dynamic to that. You, you have to have willing parties and it, it's hard work. Um, but I would say part of it is making sure that there's a diversity of voices in the space to begin with, right? Who's, who's sitting there, who's not sitting there? Um, uh, or, or who's a part of that, that process. Um, and being able to say, yes, we're reinforcing what was already before. So how do we maybe do this differently um, in, in trying to turn things on its head? Again, that doesn't mean you get rid of what we've generally called philosophy. It's more about being, um, what do I want to say? Uh, transparent about, okay, when we're talking about this philosophy, we're talking about European and Greek philosophies. Right. So let's call that European and Greek philosophy if we're going to call these other things. So it was just about thinking, renaming, redoing, reworking some of that in a, a different sort of way. I don't know if that helps or not. No, it does. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I like that stuff. What's a, I, I'm sorry, I can't, you have to speak so up. Building a larger community. So how, how do you expand that in a world where both you watch on TV shaped in a certain way? Uh, social media is not in addiction. Uh, the people you interact with, especially if you're from you know, just go into a certain church, kind of big. Even the shop, kind of, it's especially for your 
Yeah, I. So there are a multiplicity of narratives coming through all the time, right? That there's just there they're coming from everywhere. And how do you get yours noticed? And maybe how do you get your vision to be part of the, the larger vision? Um, and that has become harder as people have decided. Yeah, I'm not. I'm only interested in what I already agree with. Right? So that's that's really become a big problem. Um, what is that middle space uh, where people are trying to figure things out, and where is that happening? Um, and I, I think it has to happen uh, again, kind of in smaller spaces first, and then trying to grow those spaces. Um, but relationships are hard, right? So it's got to develop those relationships and be like, um, these are the people that I want to work with. These are the people I'm going to trust. Um, how do you know that? How long do you have to be in a relationship before you develop trust? So in the, the kind of um, old school, school community organizer way that that used to happen was you had a core group of people who were working on something, maybe say five, six, seven people. And someone else wanted new was going to new come into the group. You had to have two people vouch for that person before they came into the space. You had to say this person, I'm going to I'm going to say this person is on board with what we're talking about and that they're trusted. Like that doesn't mean you're starting from scratch then. Um, but even if you start to, to reach out into social media platforms and you say, oh, I've noticed this group of people are talking about this thing that I'm interested in. It takes some time to develop that that trust uh, first. And and so I think the, the part of, of when we think about especially social change, community organizing work, um, what I'm often talking about with students is that uh, that quick fix thing isn't going to happen, right? Or it, it might in one instance, but then if you want to carry on the vision, it's hard to keep the momentum going forward. The only way it keeps going forward is if you continue to work with the same kind of people or the same, uh, that, that collective that are holding one another accountable and saying, okay, now here's the new thing we need to be talking about. And maybe we need to bring some people in who have that as their understanding as well. Um, I don't know if that helps or not in terms of, of, of what you're asking, but uh, how do you expand that vision is really, um, it depends on the communal space that you're operating in. Um, and it also depends on uh, the fact that you have to give in to platforming issues if you're gonna use social media. Like, is it okay to use Facebook? Is it okay to use Twitter? You know, are we gonna um, all be using uh, different servers to have the conversations we're on and there are a thousand servers that are having different conversations all at the same time like like what does that look like i i think it's ever evolving currently and it's different now than it was even 10 and 15 years ago uh, when we think about organizing work so we can see in places like uh where the where the um what was called the arab spring and the the uprisings that took place um, in Egypt and Tunisia and elsewhere a few years ago, that was all driven by social media. Like people knew to come out, but then very quickly, those things got shut down. They get shut down now in other, in other places where people are starting to have that kind of collective. So when we see uprisings taking place in the United States, in Philadelphia, in the Twin Cities, other places in Ferguson, one of the first thing that happens is the, the mobile network gets shut down in order for people not to be able to communicate with one another. And so that also can become problematic in terms of how are we gonna communicate that 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 could disappear at any particular time. Um, so I don't have a simple answer for that, for sure. So I wanna say thank you to Dr. Johnson and inspiring talk. And I know I have many more questions, so I'm glad that we get to join him at um, happy hour at Homegrown um, at 5.30. But now people um, over the age of, shall we say, well, anyway, graduate students and other <laughs> students stay and everybody else has to leave. Um, but we can reconvene at happy hour. And, um, uh, and also, I just want to mention, like in terms of building beloved community, um, Dr. Johnson helped to found the Peace and Justice Studies Association. So he built a community <laughs> as, among other consulting work that he's done. 
So again, thank you again for being here. I really appreciate um, questions and you get graduate students get to ask your own now. So um, a lot of seniors on the floor. Yeah. So thank you. Mm -hmm. We'll see you at 530 at uh, homegrown. No, we can't chase him with the uncle. <laughs>